When the hurricane swirled and spread its deluge of dark evil onto the good, green land, they gloated. The western skies reverberated with joyous accounts. The tree has fallen. The great trunk is smashed. The hurricane leaves no life in the tree. Had the tree really fallen? Never. Not with our red streams flowing forever. Not while the wine of our torn limbs feed the thirsty roots. Arab roots, alive, tunneling deep, deep into the land. When the tree rises up, the branches shall flourish green and fresh in the sun. The laughter of the tree shall leaf beneath the sun, and birds shall return. Undoubtedly, the birds shall return. The birds shall return. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, the podcast taking a closer look at poetry. This week's poem is The Deluge and the Tree by Palestinian poet Fadwa Tukin. At the time of publishing, Palestine has been under assault with the threat of eradication looming heavy since October 7th of 2023. I felt it was not only the right thing to do, but the necessary thing to do to draw attention to this crisis in Palestine. And the only way I can do that with this podcast is to include more Palestinian poets and highlight their voices. This is just a drop in the ocean in terms of supporting a state that has been unfairly occupied and brutalized since 1948. Raising awareness of the pain and anguish felt by the Palestinian people through their art is the best I can do. I have also included a donation link in the description of this episode if you would like to help the Gazan relief efforts currently underway. The link is to the ISPC, or the Ireland Solidarity Palestine Campaign. Fadwa Tukin was and is to this day one of the most celebrated voices in Arab literature. She was born in Nablus in Palestine in 1917, and so lived through the invasion of Palestine in 1948. More than that, she lived through and experienced the mass displacement of Palestinians through the decades, as well as the horrendous abuses suffered by the Palestinian people. Having received little formal education, Tukin's early lessons in poetry came from her brother, Ibrahim Tukin, prominent Palestinian poet in his own right. When she was born, it was into British-occupied Palestine, shortly before the Balfour Declaration the statement of British support for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. She grew up in a strict Muslim household, one that clung closely to the idea of silent women. Her father was the patriarch of that family and ruled the house with an iron fist. Such was the oppression she faced as a woman in her family that her earliest poetry was published under a pseudonym, Dananir. Her earliest works discussed the themes of silencing women, the suffering of girls, and the need for a kind of Muslim feminism, one that would give the voices back to the women of Palestine. Her work in this area is enough to secure her rightful place in literary history. But in 1948, the theme, tone, and voice of her poetry would be changed forever. In 1948, the Nakba happened. The term Nakba is an Arabic term that translates literally to catastrophe. It is used to refer to the violent mass displacement of Palestinians from their homes to make way for the Israeli state. The Nakba encompassed the violent displacement of Palestinians, the destruction of over 500 Palestinian villages, and the creation of permanent Palestinian refugees during and after the 1948 invasion. Approximately 700,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled, representing about 80% of the Arab inhabitants of what became Israel. Fadwa Tukan lived through this horrific ordeal, and it fundamentally changed herself and her work. She, like many Palestinian poets, became a voice of resistance, one that spoke to the Palestinian people directly, urging them at once to fight for their land while simultaneously ensuring their people did not lose hope in the face of an overwhelming military enemy. The year 1948 shook not only her country, but also her personal life, as it was the year her father died. As you might expect, her work became increasingly political after 1948. 
though her confidence in writing on such matters did not. She frequently expressed an uncertainty as to whether she should be the one to give voice to nationalist anguish. Unfortunately, further tragedy for Palestine would eradicate her doubt and replace it with a burning need to speak up. In 1967, just 19 years after the first, the second Nakba event happened. Another violent wave of targeted displacement was undertaken by the Israeli government, this time with further regulatory restrictions to stop any of the displaced from returning to their homelands. This event would later become known as the Naksa, in Arabic, escalation, for ease of distinguishing. The violent and callous manner in which the Israeli state undertook both these mass displacements made it clear to the world that they were in no way interested in negotiation or land sharing. It made it even clearer to Palestinians that they would have to fight. Fadwa Tukan numbered among those who came to that realization. For the remainder of her career, she would emerge as the voice of the resistance, constantly crafting poems that would stoke the fires of defiance in Palestinian hearts and made sure they would remain hopeful no matter what. She was so successful in this endeavor that even a former Israeli general, Moshe Dayan, likened her poetry to facing 20 enemy commandos. This week's poem, The Deluge and the Tree, is a prime example of Tukin's powerful words. It first appeared in her collection Daily Nightmares, published in 1988. The English translation of today's poem was by Naomi Shahab Nye, with the help of the editor of the Anthology of Modern Palestinian Literature, which was published in 1992. There are three stanzas that I will read in turn, beginning with the first. When the hurricane swirled and spread its deluge of dark evil onto the good green land, they gloated. The western skies reverberated with joyous accounts. The tree has fallen. The great trunk is smashed. The hurricane leaves no life in the tree. Immediately, a metaphor of land and nature is set before us. There is a clear antagonist in the hurricane, the force that seeks not only to destroy its opposite, a tree, but erase it altogether. The tree, on the other hand, is an unshakable symbol of resistance. It is not difficult to see which side of the conflict is represented in each symbol. Nature imagery became an integral part of Palestinian resistance poetry. As academic Barbara McKean Parmenter puts it in her excellent book, Giving Voice to the Stones, Place and Identity in Palestinian Literature, the use of place imagery in literature helps Palestinians as individuals and as a group to maintain a sense of belonging to a particular place and milieu. But it also sends a message to the outside world by incorporating nature and the local environment into the political argument. Poets and novelists depict the micro world of rural life, for example, to emphasize the Palestinians' close link to nature and the land. Tukin is reinforcing her people's tie to their land by minutia of the landscape, just as Parmenter describes. The metaphor that Tukin is creating acts as a stand-in for the Nabka and Naksa. By 1988, the term Nakba had evolved to become an all-encompassing one to describe the ongoing atrocities committed by the Israeli government against the Palestinian people. The hurricane then seems a fitting symbol for the attempted ethnic cleansing of the land. The hurricane leaves no life in the tree. Tukan invokes biblical imagery in her use of deluge, conjuring up images of the great flood. She leaves no doubt that a war of good and evil is being waged, dark evil being brought onto the good land. There are careful but deliberate references to the fact that the people arriving in their land are foreign. They is emphasized with two quotation marks and the western skies leave us under no doubt as to where this invasion is coming from. The words reverberated with joyous account describe the bizarre celebrations this invading force undertakes when they believe that their attempts have been successful. The tree has fallen, the great trunk is smashed. In other words, hooray, we've successfully eradicated the Palestinians. 
A wonderfully poetic but simultaneously brutal tone is established by Fadwa Tukan in this poem. One that highlights the sinister sense of victory felt by a force inflicting violence and murder on innocent civilians. It does this whilst at the same time paying homage to the beauty of their landscape, their green land. The choice of a tree as the symbol for Palestine is incredibly poignant. In my other episode on the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, which I've linked below in the description, I explained how the olive tree had become a symbol synonymous with the Palestinian nationalist cause due to its deep roots and resilient nature. Here we can see that self-same imagery being utilized. In fact, it becomes the core of the second stanza. Had the tree really fallen? Never. Not with our red streams flowing forever. Not while the wine of our torn limbs feed the thirsty roots. Arab roots, alive, tunneling deep, deep into the land. If the first stanza is the tragedy come to Palestine, then the second is surely the resistance that met it. It starts with a questioning of history, which in a sense is just a question of narrative. Had the tree fallen? In this simple rhetorical question, Tukin introduces a note of skepticism to her reader about the sanitized Western narratives around the invasion of her home. The reports of the success of Israel and their right to this land have been greatly overemphasized throughout history, if not outright false altogether. Tukin answers all of this with a resounding never. From here, she creates a beautiful tapestry of landscape, culture, and biology. She combines the bodies of Palestinian people literally with the land, not with our red streams flowing forever. This is both a nod to the blood that continues pumping through her countrymen's veins, but also at the same time understanding Palestine cannot rest until blood stops being spilled into their rivers. This notion of the unflinching witnessing of violence is driven home in the next few lines. Not while the wine of our torn limbs feed the thirsty roots. Their land is literally drinking the blood from those limbs. This evocation of torn body parts leaves the reader in no doubt that these people are under real threat. Fadwa Tukan rallies once again, claiming that those drinking vines are Arab roots alive. She is cementing the idea that Palestine is an Arabic place. She is impressing upon the speaker that they belong to this land and have for the longest time, deep, deep into the land. This stanza is not only an account of atrocity and violence, but a testament to the Palestinian will to resist. It's not surprising to find this kind of fervor in poetry from the country. Poets like Fadwa Tukan and Mahmoud Darwish became essential both in stirring nationalist sentiment and providing hope for the continuing struggle. There is a loose parallel to be drawn between them and the Irish nationalists back in the early 1900s who did the same during the Celtic revival. In Palestine, like in much of Arab literature, poetry holds a special place for public discourse. It is not the elitist niche discipline that it sometimes appears as in Western Anglocentric cultures. As academic Mohammed Sawiye puts it, it should be noted that poetry has an extremely high status among other cultural productions in Arab culture. Poetry arises for a variety of occasions. It is not some rarefied genre of literature, but one with some mass appeal to a variety of audiences and readerships. More than other literary genres, Poetry has played a similar role among Palestinians in Israel, and it is characterized as a product created spontaneously in reaction to events. Fadwa Tukan is without a doubt writing in reaction to horrific events, but she is also writing to help people look past the present and understand that there is hope. This is what the third stanza is all about. When the tree rises up, the branches shall flourish green and fresh in the sun. The laughter of the tree shall leaf beneath the sun, and birds shall return. Undoubtedly, the birds shall return. The birds shall return. In the words the tree rises up, there is a call to resistance, an understanding that a passive response cannot be the answer. There is a recognition 
that when this act of rebellion takes place, the tree can not only heal, but flourish. Fadwal Tukan paints a picture of a happier Palestine, one filled with laughter and sunshine. The tree takes on another symbolism, as a place of shelter and calm, a point of relief in what feels like an endless struggle. There is a lot of repetition here, words like tree and sun being repeated multiple times. This is important, it is almost a chant of sorts, not a violent one at all, but a reminder of what Palestine could be again. The end of the poem uses the refrain of birds, and birds shall return, undoubtedly the birds shall return, the birds shall return. Birds are a traditional symbol of peace. They've been used throughout history and literature to symbolize that. Fadwa Tukan uses this symbol in repetition to remind both herself and Palestinians one day they will succeed. One day history will write itself and the world will recognize Palestine as a state again. But most importantly, above all else, Palestinians will know peace again. The deluge and the tree has a very simple message. Free Palestine. Fadwa Tukan passed away in 2003, but her words, sadly, remain as necessary as ever. In this poem, she has created a very simple metaphor for the Palestinian struggle. One that shows just how outnumbered and overwhelmed Palestine truly is. In the face of a government that wants nothing but their complete eradication. As I said at the beginning, at the time of publishing, Gaza has been under siege for weeks. There is no amount of logic, historical weaving, or any kind of argument that can justify this. War and genocide is being waged on people who have had no respite for decades. A people who are at the mercy of a military that outweighs them in every measure. If you'd like to donate to the Gazan relief effort, as I said, I've included a link to the ISPC Ireland Solidarity Palestine campaign in the description. If you'd like to hear more Palestinian poetry, you can check out the link to my episode on Mahmoud Darwish, also linked below. Other than that, keep sharing Palestinian content and amplifying Palestinian voices. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode.